Thank you. We... Thank you. We're just slightly aware that the um, uh, normally seamless and smooth transition is um, taking slightly longer than usual, so we didn't want you to think that we weren't coming back out. So I'm <laughs> essentially here um, as a dancing monkey for the next um, uh, few, until Jordan. <laughs> Hi, that was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, I want to ask about everything. Um, I'm going to start well, with... We have half an hour, that should be fine, right? Um, I'm going to start with, with kind of a, a warm and fuzzier one, and then we'll get to sadism uh, later. Uh, this is, I just, okay, so I thought we would start um, by talking about novellas as a form um, because you recently published two, uh, The Last Days of New Paris and The Census Taker. And, and we, could actually, we could actually talk about novellas alongside what I think, I could be wrong, might be a little bit of a psychoanalytic turn in your writing, by which I mean a, a concern with the relation between trauma and the unrepresentable, yeah. or the unrepresentable in prose forms. Yeah. So that and novellas, and we can talk about the novella is each in more detail, but I also wanted to ask you just a little bit about the novella as a form. Yeah. I can go on, but I'm going to yeah. let you go. <laughs> I mean, you're, I think you're right about the... Um, I think there's probably a relation between the, the, int the, the, the increasing interest I have in the novella as a form, uh, and it's not an interest that's... Um, that's uh, that's just me. I mean, I think more. I've seen novellas sort of cropping up. Mm -hmm. So that um, uh, Zadie Smith just did a novella, and and various other people who are publishing things as standalone novellas, which traditionally has been a very difficult pitch for publishers. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a little bit of a turn, um, and I I hadn't particularly thought of it in terms of that kind of relationship of, sort of language that you're that you're talking about. But I think you're right. I think. I'm not suggesting for a minute that I'm not, you know, still interested in longer, you know, novels and so on. But I think there's something about basically the longer a book gets, the um, the more room there is for it to f for things to be wrong in it. And that's fine. All books have things wrong in them. Mm -hmm. But there's something about the kind of perfection of a novella that that really works, which I think um, I think the best novella is always better than the best novel. And I think probably a lot of people won't agree with that, but there is a power to uh, to an effective novella that I think is is, is completely mm -hmm. unique. And in terms of what you're saying about trauma and so on, I th I suspect that that this is related to kind of different phases of writing, like um, when you know the, the 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 three long books, the, my mm -hmm. second, third, and fourth book, feel to me very much now uh, a, young, a young writer's books. Um, and there's quite a lot of writing about, about ma mature style and like, you know, uh, like Saeed's work mm -hmm. on, on, on late style and so on. But I haven't seen an enormous amount of work on the middle period of a writer. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've been getting increasingly fascinated with at the moment because I think partly from kind of selfish reasons, which is that I think, assuming I don't die very young, um, I am, well, I mean, this is a serious consideration. My mother did die very young, and so I have a very strong sense of mortality and so on. Um, but I, I hope that I'm entering a middle period, and I think there's a, there's a specificity to middle periods. And I've been reading writers, like Ballard is the middle period writer I've got most interested in, because there can be a tendency with some writers to sort of settle into a kind of relatively comfortable and efficient groove of what they know how to do. And then you've got someone like Ballard who goes very much a different way and starts breaking a lot of what he had previously done. Um, and I think I would like there to be more discussion about middle periods because they seem to me to be a kind of intrinsically traumatic moment mm -hmm. in some ways. Plus, you know, one has all the kind of specific traumas and so on. And so this census taker in particular is very much at least for me, very much about trauma um, mm -hmm. and language and what language can't say. Right. And that, maybe that's another reason for being interested in novellas is 
because there are fewer words. And I, I've got increasingly interested in, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the, in the introductory thing, in, in apophasis, in the, the unrepresentable, the unsayable. Um, and somehow I feel like novellas are particularly good at that. Yeah, yes, can I, I'm gonna not push back, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna continue though. I mean, one of the truisms about novellas, and I don't think it's necessarily a useful truism, is that the characters don't have to undergo any development in the, in the same way that they're forced to do, basically, in the novel. Mm -hmm. You have to develop, to get, the character has to change. Mm -hmm. In novella, you're supposed to be dealing with characters who are developed, but your novellas, so like, so we think about the census taker, which begins with that incredible moment of traumatic de-characterization that is also the onset of the subject. Mm -hmm. This literalization of the Oedipal scenario that you start with, right, you know it is that, where mm. the character believes that he sees his father killing his mother, and he can't even say it. This in, isn't spoilers, by the way, it happens very It's early. the first page. <laughs> But he can't even say it in his language is disjointed. He says, yeah. my father, someone, my mother. It's a terrifying, it's very good. Um, but, but your novella seems to be ranged around this idea of the character, uh, of, an in, uh, of a character who's on some level, constitutively really, of all subjects, yeah. incomplete to himself, absent yeah, yeah. to himself. I think that, I mean, th this census taker, although I'm aware that it's a book that has a lot of people who have liked a lot of my other things have really disliked. It's had a very mixed reaction among a lot of readers. And there's a problem, I think, when, you're, when you write, um, when you defend, when you particularly defend or like a, a work which is less popular, there can be a, a, an intimation that you're being kind of contrary or defensive or both. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure I am both contrary and defensive and both, but I also, from where I'm sitting, I think there's very little question in my mind that this census taker is the best thing I've done. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, I always think it's the mortality thing again. I think in terms of what three books would, if I could only have three books, for some reason it's three, in my coffin, what would they be? And this census taker is definitely one of them. And I think it is very much, you're, I think you're right, it's something to do with the relationship to character. I think. There's a lot of ways people talk about character in fiction that makes little sense to me as a reader. I don't mean in a kind of professorial way, like yeah. I think they're wrong. I just don't experience reading that way. And the most obvious and overt is when people say, as they do all the time, you know, I hate this book because I really hated the main character. Mm -hmm. It's just such an extraordinary way of reading. I don't understand it at all. But then there's, a, there's, a, there's another one which I find, which is maybe not quite as, um, as, as, as bizarre to me, but it's pretty close, which is, um, I hated this because I didn't understand it. And it's often to do with the characters. I didn't understand the characterization, or I didn't, you know, or, but sometimes it's just to do with the story as a whole. And all I can say in response to that, and again, I'm sorry, I genuinely am sorry if it sounds defensive, is most of the, most of the books that I love the most, I don't for one second think I understand. Not only that, it's the not understanding that makes me love them. I mean, the obvious example I use a lot is, um, is Kafka. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, know, you, you, sort of, you, know, you read Odredek or you read you know, Metamorphosis and you say, well, I like that because I got it. You know, like mm -hmm. it's just, <laughs> it's precisely because I don't know what's going on that mm -hmm. I keep going back to it. And the thing about, I think the thing about stuff that is, that, that, that this, this is related to character because it's, you're saying it's to do with the opacity of, the work as a whole, right. I hope, but also the, the characters within it. And a lot of these nostrums about character development, character arc, are predicated on a really unconvincing model of both mm. fictional characters and indeed real people. And that notion of like the opacity of, of people, both real and depicted, mm -hmm. including to themselves, yeah. spills over also into the book. So I don't understand this census taker either, and that's why I like mm -hmm. it so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, but, so there's a trajectory, I think, from Embassy Town on where you overlay two traumas. There's just the constitutive trauma of subject formation of, of 
being a character uh, opaque to yourself. Um, and then there are always the historical traumas also unrepresentable or unrepresented. So in Baslag, it has been speculated, I'm sorry, in the census taker, it's been speculated that it's part of the Baslag world because it's referenced. You don't have to respond to that. Um, it's a rumor, but it, it's referenced that there's an, a potentially failed revolution. Yeah. That's never shown. Um, and then we have this, what I'm going to call the literalization of the Oedipal trauma. But then uh, uh, embassy town as well, you have the kind of trauma of the, of the colonization of the Iraq world. And then there's this traumatic incident that happens yeah. to the main character where she becomes a simile, where she functions as language, which I won't um, redact for the audience. Um, and I think... So I think, but, I, but what I've been wondering now in relation to this is about the children's book that you wrote. Because, well, but if, if you permit me, that is also ranging around this question of memory. Because mm -hmm. one of the characters in the children's book recalls this worst breakfast, that it's called the worst breakfast, that they had, and the other character doesn't. Yeah. And, it, and one needs to recount it to the other. Yeah. And I was wondering if there's a kind of reparative nature that you're only able to do in a children's book where a, a memory that's impossible is collectively restored. Or, and if you think that, that there's something about a, a, the writing for children, yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that. The context for this, for people who don't know, is that recently I published a picture book for very, like three-year-olds um, with the great artist Zach Smith. Um, and it's called The Worst Breakfast, and it's about exactly this. It's a discussion of the worst breakfast that these two sisters ever had, and one of them can remember it, and the other one can't. It's very moving. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about this as you, as you ask it, because what you're doing is, is, is you're, you're, you're putting things in ways that hadn't occurred to me, but that feel quite um, intuitively persuasive, particularly there is something, I think, specific about writing for young readers. I think that's true. I hadn't thought about it in terms of reparative fiction, but I really mm -hmm. like that. And partly because um, I've been reading um, uh, Eve Sedgwick and th th this notion of like um, paranoid and mm -hmm. um, reparative readings. There is a... if. The older I get, the, I, I didn't start with a sense of the world as, you know, unwounded and essentially good. But the older I get, the more I feel that it's, 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 it's terrible, it's unsustainable, mm -hmm. it's, it's brutal, it's dreadful. Yeah. I get more and more upset about it. Um, but that doesn't lead to a kind of quietism. It doesn't lead to a, quite the opposite. I feel more... Uh, more motivated at the moment, more politically motivated, more artistically motivated, <clears throat> those things rise, as does my sense of, um, of the scale of how bad things are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, this is partly why I get very concerned. I mean, we've talked about this before. This is partly why I get quite concerned about uh, the recourse to hope. People talk mm -hmm. a lot about the necessity of hope. Um, you think about um, Solnit's recent stuff on hope mm -hmm. and so on. And in, in, the, in the very simple sense of like, you know, if you don't have a hope, if you don't believe at all that things could get better, there's no point doing anything, that's fine. But a lot of the talk about hope, political hope, and hope in fiction is very unconvincing. And it feels to me, uh, particularly among the left, and it feels to me more like a hope for hope. It's a kind of meta hope. It's terrified of its own fear. And I think that one of the things we have to start doing is, is mourning and grieving. There's a, there's a left slogan, which is don't mourn, organize. And I hate that slogan, because mm -hmm. there's no contradiction between the two. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you don't mourn, you're not going to be able to organize. So mm -hmm. there is, I think, a kind of gentleness and a joy in writing for young children that allows you into this sense of not restoration, but re reparation, reparativeness. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the nice thing about that heuristic is that it, it doesn't deny that things are bad, but it's, sort of, um, it's a way of both reading and writing that you can kind of try and find ways of continuing anyway. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but I do think that's true. A, a lot of the stuff I'm trying to do at the moment, and not just me, lots and lots and lots of people, is 
is keep going. Mm. Well, you've, you've led us to the question about sadism. Um, and, and you've written very explicitly about what you call uh, the return or rise of social sadism. Mm. Uh, and I'm gonna quote you here. The sadism of capitalism is a deep grammar and it is always functional and, but it is never only functional. With the jouissance or the enjoyment comes the surplus, what bad time might call its accursed share. In neoliberalism's decadence, social sadism is entering a febrile new stage. So, so okay, so you've been deeply engaged for a long time in a variety of ways with the idea of capitalism's very complex palette of cruelty. And uh, there are two kind of directions that we can take a question about that. One is, if you, if, uh, if you wanted to say a little bit more about these thoughts on sadism as a political diagnosis for the present, the Brexit, Trump, moment, these large scale movements of overt sadism into the political center with the caveat, yeah. of course, that these, um, our imperial hegemons are constitutively sadistic um, at their root. But I think maybe you're wanting to think about a shift in the political landscape of late where the mask of democracy has been completely disposed of. Or, and or we can talk about it in relation to the role of sadism in your art. Um, there are primordially terrifying father, the primordially terrifying father and the census taker, the staging of battles between surrealism and fascism in New Paris, which I think are scenes that draw us back to a kind of more radical uh, post-colonial roots of surrealism, what um, Suzanne Césaire and Tropique described as surrealism sustaining a massive army of negations. So not yeah. hope but yeah. per se, yeah. but in an army of negations. So we can talk about it and we possibly can get to both, but I'm giving you the option. Do we want to talk about kind of political diagnosis in the present or how yeah. it functions in your art or both? I think that one of the things that I have in, in the nonfiction have been trying to wrestle with is there's, there's, there's sort of traditionally, I think there's two ways to think about you know, when things are terrible in, you know, modern society, uh, assuming that you're not happy with the way things are, assuming that you're not, you know, basically thinking, well, this is all hunky-dory, which some people do. But if you look at these kind of overt cruelties, mm -hmm. one way is to essentially pathologize them and to say, you know, what is this, what are these crazy, you know, these crazy people who have nothing, to, like, if, if only we get mm -hmm. rid of them and the system could return to balance. And then the other, which is common on some of the left, I think, is to be so, to want to never be caught out with shock, and so to kind mm. of never be surprised at any surplus, and to always be able mm. to explain mm. everything. It's this kind of functionalism. So it's like, well, you know, of course they did the Holocaust because this, 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 mm -hmm. that's the way the system works. And I think what I'm trying, what I've been trying to do is, is sort of mediate, is to kind of, um, get beyond those two. And that's why that formulation used about and or, this idea that, this, that cruelty, I think, is, 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 is absolutely integral to our system. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there isn't sometimes a surplus, which, if you like, is beyond the baseline cruelty that the system would need, a kind of rationally cruel system. There is also an invested surplus, which the system can then fold into itself, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But one of the important things I think about recognizing that is that it allows you to talk about a, a structural shift. And you can, it changes. Like, I think, I, I think that we are, and I, I, apt, I think Trump, to this extent, is a symptom, not a cause. I think we are tipping into a new epoch. Mm -hmm. a different way of doing capitalism. I think this is, I don't think this is like, well, we just got to get through these four years and then we can get back. I think things are shifting massively. Essentially that we've been in, you know, um, a phase for roughly three and a half mm -hmm. decades and it's shifting. And one of the axes on which that's shifting is this relationship to this kind of surplus cruelty. Yeah. And you can track this, you can track it just mm -hmm. very simply in sort of, for example, um, popular American attitudes, to, I'm not singling out Americans, by the way, um, I mean, around the world, but take this example of um, popular attitudes in the States to uh, the death penalty and to particular kinds of extreme incarceration. It's absolutely, there's no question that they've grown coarser, crueler, harder, uh, and more 
kind of invested in a sort of, on a mass level, I'm not, you know, obviously there's plenty of counterexamples and heroic fights back against this, but over 20 years, mm -hmm. you can, practices which would have been unthinkable have become norms. Um, and then there's a, a baying for more. And, and I, I, I think that, uh, you know, in a, in a way that, that the system's ability to kind of metabolize what was in one instant a surplus cruelty and mm -hmm. make it functional is the most terrifying thing. And in mm -hmm. terms of your, and that doesn't mean that those cruelties weren't like there in germ seed form and indeed, you know, sort of yeah. continuing for, as you say with the Cesar reference, like particularly internationally for centuries. And I think that's, that's what gets to the second question, which is the art, fiction, music, anything can't help but reflect and, and sort of refract its, its context. And I think that I was born basically at the moment that time went out of joint and mm. the kind of end of the, of the long 50s. I was born in 72, I was born like at the, when things started to abruptly pitch, the dollar shock and so on. And I'm now entering my middle period, I hope, at a point where we shift into whatever post-neoliberalism is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think post-neoliberalism is, you know, carceral sadomonitorism. Um, and <laughs> it would be very surprising if that stuff isn't right there in, in the books, as it is in lots of books, including the books by people that don't care about this and aren't mm -hmm. thinking about it. But if you're someone who does think about it, then obviously it becomes a little bit more um, overt. And New Paris is interesting because in, in some ways it's, it's quite a, uh, it's quite a, a counterexample to a lot of the other stuff. It's a much more light book and it's a much more playful book and it's a book that's sort of invented around the idea of a, it, it's essentially a novelization of an idea I had for a video game, but I don't mm. have the power to get a video game made, so I wrote the novelization instead, or the novellaization. And to that extent, although it is for adult readers, it has more of that kind of playful nature that, that you might associate mm. with the, the books for younger readers, which I think is partly why there is a lot more, it, it, it's a bit less, it's about trauma, but it doesn't feel quite as traumatized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to me. And yeah, it's also just an opportunity to kind of honor not just the surrealism, which has been so important to me, but particular traditions of surrealism, mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of the more marginalized traditions of surrealism. Um, which I think have been really constitutive, both to the politics and to the art. I'm thinking about something that you said um, in, during the reading in the short story. I think I'm quoting you correctly. The commons of damnation are privatized. Did you say this? Yeah. Okay. I really liked that. I think this is, relates to this idea I'm harping on about your grasp of an anti-fascist hell, or that neither, that neither realm can be abandoned by mm. the forces of resistance. Um, I mean, I, I think as for the, the political moment that we're in, I mean, without making a, there's a, there's a really horrible um, compression of um, both just a total carnival of domination without consent in the West, which is a different time for hegemony in the West. Um, and it may have something to do with, I don't know, with privatizing. Once you privatize so many of the functions of the state, in, in other words, in forms of so-called care, the state is free to just be an overt monster. It doesn't mm. even have to have the fiction of being for the people anymore. I don't even know if that's right. But um, that, that married with, I, we, we had, um, Nikhil Singh right for The Last Salvage, uh, in which he made the argument that um, dispensing the mask of um, democracy has, in this moment takes specifically the character of an inversion of victimhood, where the state, yeah. so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's sadism, but it's, even, like, it's an even more repulsive version of sadism where the state as oppressor is adopting this yeah. kind of um, caricatured persona of woundedness that is borrowing from the language of identity politics to yeah. express like a ressentiment that is married with total power. Yeah, well you see that in a very banal way, in a very kind of silly way in when, uh, for, I mean the most obvious, it's, it's really cheap to quote Trump because it's, 
it, it, like if, you know, obviously if he was scripted, it would be sent back like, you know, too broad rewrite, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but <laughs> but his, his thing when Pence got like spoken to incredibly politely, far too politely by the Hamilton cast and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Trump was essentially calling for a, a safe space, you know, mm -hmm. uh, right. using the language of like student activism and so on. And you see, uh, um, so th there's a kind of really uh, right. kind of parodic level of that. Um, and I think that, um, I think that there is, I mean, for me, the, there's, a, there's a complicated negotiation because the, uh, the recognition of the realities of trauma and, and, and what trauma creates uh, is, has been you know, a very, very important political mm -hmm. movement and moment. But I also think that the sort of, uh, the, the, the kind of recourse to, vic not recourse, that, I want to retract that word, but the sort of, the, a certain kind of sacralized victimhood can, it's not just the right that can do this, and that can create a very problematic mm -hmm. politics, I think. So the, the way of kind of negotiating the acknowledgement of quite how bad things are and quite how real trauma is, and then acknowledging that that doesn't mean that one is ruined by it. That doesn't mean that one is irreparably mm. harmed by it. That, that doesn't mean that one cannot salvage oneself mm. and salvage oneself in, in, in the comradeship of others is a very complicated negotiation, well, but I think it's a crucial one. And, and not to be too glib, and I would want to say this with very kind of, with a lot of care, I think one of the things that art and fiction can do is be a, a, a component of that salvaging process. And the reason I'm... Sorry to so the, the reason I'm harping on the the reason why that's important to me is I think I think for a long time I had a kind of um, a sort of guilt complex about I, I had a lot of guilt about about being essentially a fiction writer that I felt that it was I, I think some part of me felt because I wouldn't have defended this intellectually but I think some part of me felt that it was an indulgence, and that really what one should be doing is writing like you know important actual things that matter, nonfiction. Uh, and of course, lots of my you know friends and people who are just as political as me were saying that no, this is ridiculous. Don't be silly. And I think one of the things that started to happen, but, but the, the reason that I was thinking that is because there is a. I also think that a lot of claims that are made for writing and for art are ridiculously overblown. So the idea that like you know we turn to literature to kind of foster our empathy, to heal us, to kind of heal society. Plenty of dictators have wonderful taste in books. Mm -hmm. Plenty of awful fascists write beautiful things, like genuinely great books written by sadistic people. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially, I think this is a kind of, um, this is a kind of, uh, it's a kind of comforting fiction that a particular kind of liberal literature tells about itself, and I didn't want to fall into that. But I'm tentatively feeling now a little bit more at peace with, like kind of constitutively at peace, rather than just intellectually knowing it's true, with the idea that fiction, and indeed, you know, art and music and so on, are, you know, genuinely are not just fripperies and that they're certainly not everything, but they are a component of something, and what that something may be is a, is a process of salvage. Well, the salvage, I mean, that really gets to this, uh, the kind of really um, consistent presence in your work of um, this, the dissolution of the fiction of bodily integrity and your literary practice as perhaps a kind of structural resistance to the sadism that we're describing, although I think the jury is still out on whether sadism is best represented as excess or discipline, but perhaps it's both. Um, but no, but can I interrupt you for a second? Because I think that's course. really important. I think yeah. that's really, okay. really important, which is that for a long time, I think that there was this notion that like, essentially sadism is buttoned up. Right. And you know, the classic figure of the political sadist is the, you know, in culture is the Nazi in his, you know, in his black leather standing ramrod straight. And it's this notion of repression right. that bursts out into sadism. So that essentially sadism is a kind of excrescence of repression. And what that neglects is the very strong law. I mean, it's not as powerful a cultural tradition, but that very strong 
cultural tradition of the fascist Baroque, the fascist Rococo, right. the, sure. the, the kind of, you know, the, the dandy, the, you know, the sadistic dandy. And, um, and I think that's quite important because it's important politically because, <laughs> because it allows us to understand that, you know, the figure that may come the rough beast slouching towards Bethlehem may not be in the shape that we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, it's, I think it's artistically important because it punctures a certain kind of self-conceit, which is that because we are flamboyant and playful, we are essentially the forces of life and joy and, you know, well, you know, bullshit. There mm -hmm. were... You know, there, there, there were clowns doing the, you know, doing the murdering in, in, in a lot of camps, and I don't just mean camps in Germany, you know. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, yes, the, I got, think, <laughs> yes, I know. This, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm trying to segue to us to something that's easier to end on than clowns murdering murderous clowns. But I think, well, I mean... I mean, it's not unfitting. It's um, not unfitting. Uh, I think it's, it's very it's fitting. Not, it's All right. <laughs> thank, thank you. I mean, I suppose we are out of time. Um, I guess I'll just say I do think that your work inserts a very important wedge of body horror between the murderous clowns and... and uh, and and us just because just because the grotesque can be about sadism doesn't mean it can't also be anti-sadistic right. and if i can hope for anything it would be that the grotesque which i love is an anti-sadistic grotesque that is my hope as well uh, thank you very much thank you thank you thank you for